House of the Dragon. It was pretty okay, I guess. Nothing special. <laughs> A bad joke, your grace. Oh wait, no, it was only the best show of the entire year. Bravo, HBO. We were all let down by the last few seasons of Game of Thrones. It was underwhelming, bizarrely paced, and downright awkward at times. But it's been talked about to death, and I know the YouTube algorithm rewards that juicy rage bait, but let's be positive today. I want to talk about my favourite episode of Hot D, although that's not an easy task. Episode 1 needed to introduce multiple new characters, plot threads and themes to an audience who are mostly watching with their arms crossed in caution, and it brought Westeros and the fandom roaring back to life. Episode 3 had a fun, if slightly nonsensical battle scene, with blood and fire and Daemon Targaryen stealing the show without uttering a single word. Meanwhile, Episode 4 was drenched in atmosphere and intrigue, managing to portray spicy scenes that felt seedy, disturbing, titillating, in very stark contrast to Game of Thrones' empty, almost goofy, lewd scenes. Too old. Episode 7 gave us banger after banger from Vhagar's flight to the children's fight, leaving Aemond with half his sight and Rhaenyra to face Alicent's spite. Okay, I'll stop now, I promise. For me, my favourite episode of the dragon show was the one without the dragons. So let's dive into episode 8, The Lord of the Tides. I will not see it ended on the account of this. <laughs> So this episode takes place after a six year time skip. A certain snake has fallen ill, the illness in question being a sliced neck. God, this guy's tough. A lifetime by the sea has made Vaymond Valarian extra salty, and he wants to be named heir to Driftmark. Not without good reason, let's be honest. They're white. They got brown hair. Very obvious. Ray Ray and the squad pull up to King's Landing, only to find the court has been taken over by Ali C and the Green Gang. <laughs> this is a Faith of the Seven server, please do not post curse words or loot content involving dragons. The Greens want an ally in Vaymond Valarian, so they perform this rigged petition, but Visity skips his meds and ruins their plan. He calls a reconciliatory feast, which starts out fine, but soon becomes your average Thanksgiving dinner. I think? Is that what it's like? I, I don't know, I I'm British. On his deathbed, Viserys contracts the fatal miscommunication trope, and dies shortly thereafter, but not before accidentally convincing Alicent that he wants Aegon to be king. One of the most impressive parts of this show is its ability to take vague, historical notes from Fire and Blood, and extract entire episodes out of them, filled with rich dialogue and creative story beats. This episode takes three events from the book, the Driftmark succession dispute of 126, Viserys' feast of 127, and the death of Viserys in 129, merging them into the span of a single day. In Fire and Blood, Sir Vaymond is Corlys's eldest nephew. When Corlys falls ill, not due to a battle wound but a simple fever, Vaymond openly proclaims that he should be the heir. Rhaenyra hears of this and dispatches Daemon to hunt him down, take his head, and feed his carcass to her dragon, Cyrax. Westeros is a world with consequences, and thus some of the Valarians aren't happy with this brutal execution. Namely, Vaymond's wife, and his two sons, Daeron and Damien, as well as his five cousins, consisting of Sir Malentine and Sir Rogar, which are surprisingly awesome names for such minor side characters. They all sail to King's Landing for an audience with Viserys, but the five cousins make the mistake of openly questioning the legitimacy of Rhaenyra's sons, and the king has their tongues cut out. They are soon branded with the epithet, the Silent Five. Hot D mashes all of this together to create a satisfying streamlined plot, Vaymond has become Corliss's younger brother instead of nephew, in order to simplify his claim to Driftmark for casual audiences. He acts as an amalgamation of all nine bitter Valarians. Like Book Vaymond, he proclaims himself to be the rightful heir to Driftmark and is killed by Daemon. Like the Book Valarians, he sails to King's Landing to petition the crown. And like the Silent Five, he openly insults Rhaenyra and is punished for it. And she is a I like that they kept Viserys' fury and willingness to de-tongue anyone who insults his precious daughter, as well as Daemon's execution. I wasn't expecting him to slice halfway through the head, it made the kill feel quick, messy and impulsive. While I appreciate that book fans wanted to see his body fed to Cyrax, personally I think that would have been a bit too overkill. The writers probably removed Rhaenyra's part in the murder for the same reason they have her spare lane or, in episode 7, the previous episode, her character has not yet reached that dark point. The ruthlessness can come later. While I love all of these changes, I'm curious as to the future of House Valarian in the show. Without spoiling anything, the Silent Five make a return in the book, 
So I wonder if they've been cut completely or if they will be introduced next season, perhaps as Veyman's sons and presumably with their tongues intact. I will have your tongue for that. Viserys calls a feast in 127 to celebrate his returning health after a nasty fever, which was actually brought on by slicing his hand on the Iron Throne right after ordering the five Valyrians to lose their tongues, similar to how Hot D Viserys cuts his finger after banishing Daemon. He demands that Rhaenyra and Alicent both attend with all their children. Rhaenyra wears green and Alicent wears black in a show of apparent amity, while their children break bread together. Daemon even toasts Otto Hightower, if, <laughs> if you can believe that. Yet, when the king leaves, so too do the pretenses. Aemond One-Eye gives a speech calling his nephews strong boys, while Aegon and Gisaris almost break into a fight after the latter asks Helena for a dance. The following morning, Rhaenyra and her family immediately leave for Dragonstone. This is one of my favourite moments from Fire and Blood and I couldn't wait to see it adapted. Little did I know it would be better than anything I could imagine. The tense facade presented in the book is so much more complex and nuanced in the show. Viserys' emotional speech to his family, begging for their reconciliation, does not fall on deaf ears. Rhaenyra and Alicent's kind words feel legitimate, and their final scene together is tender and tragic in retrospect. Book Alicent is ten years older than Rhaenyra and fulfils the cold bitchy stepmother trope. In Hot D, they're legitimate childhood friends, and this dynamic makes their relationship far more intimate, their brief reconciliation far more believable, and their future decisions far more tragic. Rhaenyra and Alicent make up, and while we don't see Daemon's friendly speech towards Otto, which would have been hilarious, let's be honest, the adults are all acting with respect and seem to be genuinely enjoying themselves. Instead of trying to start a fight with Jace after he innocently asks Helena for a dance, Hot D Aegon spends the night mocking and provoking his nephew, who strikes back by whisking Helena away, using her to get at him. Aemon's speech, which is ripped straight from the page, does not rise from nowhere, but is provoked by Lucerus's immature giggling over a roast pig, reminding Aemon of his bullied youth, which is also made up in the show. This generational trauma comes to a head after Aemon's speech in a short, impulsive burst of intrafamilial violence. By not having the entire event be a complete and total facade, it highlights the tragedy of the younger generation, raised on the fear-mongering and grudges of their parents and grandparents. If there's one change I dislike, it has to be the dresses. Now, don't get me wrong, they are beautiful, especially Rhaenyra's, but I would have loved to see them wearing each other's colours like in the book. I suppose this feeds into an overarching issue I have with the show as a whole, the lack of actual green in this black versus green rivalry. Rhaenyra's faction is never actually called the blacks in this entire show, and the Hightowers are called the greens, but only Alicent really actually wears green. Even in court, everyone is just wearing generic TV Westeros dark colours. Look, I'm not saying everyone needs to be wearing their faction colour at all time because that would be silly, but surely the petition would have been the perfect moment to use this, at least. I guess that's a nitpick, and again, it's more of an issue I have with the season at large than this specific episode. The final moment taken from Fire and Blood is the death of Viserys himself. By this point, the king is red-faced and fat, suffering chest pains and shortness of breath. One night he regales his grandchildren Jaehaerys, Jaehaera and Maelor with a tale about King Jaehaerys I riding beyond the wall on his dragon Vermithor, fighting an army of wildlings and giants. He goes to bed, falls asleep, and never wakes up again. Viserys' death is very different in the show. For one, there are no story time scenes from Grandpa Viz. Obviously, they're not super important, but I would have liked to see them, you know, just for the warm fuzzies. Viserys' illness is far more grotesque and tragic in Hot D, which makes this episode in particular very heart-wrenching to watch. When he muttered his final words, No more, no more, my love, it hit me hard. Reading about Viserys' death in the books, in contrast, was just meh. His death, in fact, his whole reign, is basically just a setup for something far more interesting in Fire and Blood. But the biggest change without question is the somewhat controversial miscommunication moment. We're all used to the miscommunication trope in fiction. It's a trope I absolutely despise. One, the characters being utter idiots that cannot communicate like normal people, and two, the writers being too creatively bankrupt to progress the plot in a more natural or meaningful way. However, Viserys is addled on Milk of the Poppy, and despite Alicent's best attempts to induce lucidity in him, he's rambling like a crazy old man. 
He thinks Ali is Ray, just like he thought Ray was Ali earlier on in the episode, and he brings up the pig that was promised prophecy about the pink dread who will one day unite Westeros. Wait, no, that's wrong. The prince that was promised, that's it. Shout out to season 7. Alicent misunderstands his ramblings as a declaration that her son Aegon should be the heir, because of course she doesn't know about Aegon the Conqueror's prophecy, just like 80% of the casual audience. Again, shout out to season 7. The prince who is promised will bring the dawn. <laughs> So in terms of why the miscommunication happens, well it makes sense and it's all set up well, but is it a lazy way to advance the plot? On the one hand it doesn't actually exist to advance the plot. In the next episode the green coup happens irrespective of Alicent's involvement, meaning that this scene exists to serve her character specifically, by giving her a more sympathetic reason to turn against Rhaenyra. However, by emphasising this misunderstanding as seemingly the main reason she supports the coup, I don't know, it does take away some of the conniving villainous aspects of her character that we see in Fire and Blood. Why can't she support Aegon for the throne because she wants the power, she wants the realm to be stable, she's scared for her family? It's okay to have some female villains, you know. Overall, I don't mind this moment, but I have two genuine criticisms. One. Why is the Prince Aegon prophecy never brought up during or after this scene? Not the Aegon the Conqueror prophecy, the Prince Aegon prophecy. You know, the dream Viserys had of a son on the Iron Throne with the, the crown of Aegon the Conqueror on his head. The prophecy he tells Alicent in episode 3. Wouldn't it have been more believable if she thought he was rambling about his prophecy to have a son on the throne? You know, Aegon, the dream, Prince who was promised. You can see why she would make that mistake. You could argue that it doesn't matter, that Alicent is grasping at straws and hearing what she wants to hear after years and years of telling herself and being told that her son must become the heir. Except the director Geeta Patel came out and said, nah, that's not the case. This is another season-wide issue I have with the show. There are lots of fantastic moments that feel like they're supposed to be ambiguous and debatable, but then the showrunner or the director or the episode writer comes out and they just explain it in objective terms. Just like in episode 4. Damon is about to have sex with his niece, but then he slams the wall with his fist and storms off. Why? Is it guilt over violating her? Guilt over betraying his brother? Deliberately teasing her for his own- Oh wait, no, he just can't get it up. And he basically can't handle not being in charge or in control. Oh, thanks for explaining, guys. I really love it when her mystery is taken away completely. <sighs> it is you. Oh, stunning. This feels like a good opportunity to talk about my sponsor, VZT Leprosy Legends, the viral mobile game in which you stop Viserys from sudden death. Bruh. My favourite character is Grand Maester Melos, who can summon worms and useless ointment. Hell yeah. You know, for just 10 gold dragons a month, you can unlock Grand Maester Allwhile and his Hermal Remedies. He comes with a special ability known as Medical Competence. Alright, joking aside, someone sponsor me please, I'm, I'm genuinely broke. You know who's not broke? Viserys. Look at those gold pyjamas, my man looks fly as hell. Yeah, so let's talk about this tragic king. Look, if I'm going to criticise aspects of this episode that stem from season-wide issues, I've just got to praise it as well for wrapping up a fantastic season-wide arc. For sure, this episode would not be the great send-off it is without the previous episode setting up Viserys so beautifully, but on its own merits, The Lord of the Tides manages to be his best showing yet. George R. R. Martin himself stated that the show's adaption of the fifth Targaryen king is better than his book counterpart, and I have to agree. In Fire and Blood, he's an amusing plot device. In Hot D? Well. To paraphrase Gurm himself, he embodies tragic majesty. He is a good man. A man who loves his daughter. A man who loves his realm. A man who craves peace, throughout the realm and within his own family. He is also a flawed man, admittedly. His ego stops him from truly appreciating the peace he has sustained. He is prone to many poor political decisions. And he's both blind to and incapable of solving the internecine Targaryen rift. All season long, Viserys is physically falling apart just like his family, and soon, just like his realm. 
I love his design this episode. The blend of practical and visual effects looks stunning for TV, and Paddy's performance of a dying old man is shockingly believable. I also like the Leper King vibe they went with for that mask. I kind of embraced the Targaryen realness, but... The dinner scene is beautifully tragic, as is his death scene, but Viserys' greatest scene is also the best scene of the episode. Nah, scratch that. The best scene of the entire show. No dragons, no battles, no blood, no boobs, no funny dwarf jokes. At least your balls are not freeze off. <laughs> Just a dying old man walking across the room to sit in a chair. In a vacuum, this scene is nothing, but with the music, the direction, and the context of what's come before, it's beautiful. The director Gita Patel made a deliberate choice to follow Viserys through the length of the throne room, and at no point when watching and re-watching do I ever get bored. Viserys, lucid but pained, forces himself into a throne of blades one last time to defend his daughter. But the best individual moment of this entire scene is actually improvised, as many of you have probably heard. Damon picking up the crown for Viserys was the first time I actually teared up watching Hot D. Gita Patel said that a reconciliatory Damon speech at the dinner scene was cut from this episode, both for pacing reasons and because this crown moment undercuts it, apparently. Personally, I trust this decision. When it comes to visual media, if you can summarise an entire speech in a single moment and create the same level of emotional resonance, you've succeeded. <sighs> what a great character. Great character, great send off. I always knew the time skips were coming, but for a lot of watchers they were pretty disorienting. And I don't blame them. Imagine never seeing any of the promos or trailers and then starting episode 6. I must admit my confusion. I'm a bit confused. Episode 8 handles the 6 year time skip very well. It helps that the longest and most jarring skip has already happened, and by this point the audience knows this is a season that spans lots of time. The episode can afford to be slower, unlike episode 6 which was rushing through way too much content. Things are allowed to breathe, and most of the child recasts are given proper introductions. Speaking of time skips, the age ups are kind of weird in this show, aren't they? By this point, at least 20 and a half years have passed since episode 1. Damon doesn't really age, but you know what? Neither does Matt Smith, so sue him. I do appreciate Matt Smith holding himself differently after the time skip. He's way more reserved, slightly hunched, less swaggy? Well, slightly less swaggy. Even his voice is a bit quieter, not as smug. And although I hate that wig in particular, it does age him up a bit. I've got no defence for Kristen though. <laughs> they just didn't care, did they? Look at this man. Look, I can buy his early 20s with the long hair and early 30s with the short hair, fine. But you're telling me this guy's around 40? Really? Really? Actually, no, he's Dornish, isn't he? No, I believe it. I believe it. Rhaenyra and Alison actually feel like they have aged since episode 7. Ray was fatigued and overwhelmed while Alison was frustrated and grasping, but now they both radiate more confidence. That hairstyle, along with the modest dress, really ages Alison in particular. I can buy that these women are now mid-30s, mostly just in the way that they act. Aged gone doesn't really look like young gone, but Tom Glencarney played an older version of Titanon in the Tolkien movie, so that's the logic behind that casting, I guess. I don't mind it that much, they're both pretty good. Also, daily reminder that Ty Tennant is the son of the 10th Doctor and the Doctor's Daughter, who's literally also the 5th Doctor's Daughter, making him the Doctor's son and the Doctor's Daughter's son and the Doctor's grandson, and in Hot Day he's the 11th Doctor's nephew. Thank you very much. Tom is suitably gross and kinda neurotic, although he's able to bring some vulnerability to the role. Aegon is a drunk, lecherous, pathologically bored and insecure young man. Fortunately, Alicent uses this opportunity to teach him the importance of consent and power dynamics in sexual encounters, while punishing him justly for committing a crime, stripping him of his titles and- oh wait, no, she just slapped him. I have issues with Hot D Aegon as a character that I'll be diving into in my next video. For now, I'll just say I think it was a mistake to turn him from a spoiled, pervy, lazy teen with a surprisingly likeable honesty into a joffrey tier sadist. And I think it's extremely weird that the people behind the scenes actually agree with me, but like I said, that's for another video. I've done everything you've asked me to, and I try so, I try so hard, but it will never be enough for you or father. Helena might be the best recast of the Hightower batch. Fia Saban perfectly captures the spacey innocence of her younger counterpart. Jason and Luke really look like strong boy fan art come to life. Jaceris is more confident and prone to anger, while Lucerus is more unsure of himself and a bit immature. They don't have too much screen time, but the episode does a good job differentiating White Boy 1 from White Boy 2. They're white. I think that's everyone, right? Did I miss anyone important? All right, yeah, this absolute Chad. Plot twist, Damon had a love child with himself and called him Eamon. Have sex, have sex, have sex. I've never seen a live action character who looks more like fantasy fan art than actual fantasy fan art. Oh yeah, in no universe is this a 16 or 17 year old, but eh, who cares. His presence is quiet and intimidating, and it's no surprise he's quickly become a fan favourite. Look at this man. 
He's trying so hard to be Damon. I suppose deep down he's still that traumatised ten year old who went from insecurity to egomania to bitter spite over the course of a nighttime theme park ride and a scuffle around the back of Greg's. When Vizzy T is away, the children will play. And by play, of course, I mean grievous bodily harm and battery. Each of them handsome, wise, say it. Bastard! Speaking of battery, no, no, I, I can't find a good segue. But speaking of segues, let's explore the visual storytelling of Lord of the Tides. Something about this episode from the writing to the directing just had a little bit extra. It's not afraid to convey story and character through visuals. For instance, the Valyrian imagery and erotica has been stripped down this episode and replaced with prudish faith symbolism. An unsurprising move from the high towers of Old Town, which is basically like Vatican City mixed with Oxford. Alison's dress and hair is also far more conservative and boasts the seven-pointed star, keeping with the tradition of her revolving fashion sense throughout the season. You have the innocence of the blue dress, the submission of the Targaryen red dress, and the defiance of the Hightower green dress. This outfit displays her outwardly pious persona, but it disappears from the story. At the end of the episode, when the friendship temporarily heals, and in episode 9, in the face of a crisis. The gap between Rhaenyra and Alison isn't subtle, but it's a nice reference to Doug Weekly's famous drawing from Fire and Blood. Some fans have even noticed that the blacks always appear on the left side of Viserys, and the greens on his right side. In the bedroom, in the throne room, even at dinner. Is this a visual way of associating the greens with corruption and blindness, like the rotting side of Viserys' face? Or is it just a fun fan theory? I don't know, but I like that these are the kinds of discussions people are having. This is also an episode of little moments, you know, the ones that don't need to be there but add so much to the characters. There's a fantastic callback to episode one I didn't even notice in my first couple of watches. David. Brother. Or how about the moment after Damon snips Vaymond and we see the High Tower's reactions? Aegon looking shook, Aemond looking fascinated, and Helena covering her ears as if she's overstimulated, feeding into that neurodivergent vibe they've given her. And speaking of the High Towers, we're given two simple but very effective moments that show Otto's relationship with his grandchildren. He glares at Aegon, disapproving of his alcoholism, but nods reassuringly at Helena after her awkward speech. Wait, is he gripping his sword in anticipation of a fight? Well, I guess he is a knight after all. That's a nice touch. You know, in my episode 8 review, I had a fun bit where I called out everyone's familial connection to Viserys to highlight the inbred absurdity of it all. But I can't just repeat the same meme, right? Ah, screw it, here you go. What a lovely dinner, so nice of Vizzy T to invite his... <gasps> Wife, hand and father-in-law, second grandson, firstborn daughter and daughter-in-law, firstborn son and son-in-law, eldest grandson and first cousin twice removed and stepnephew and eventual nephew-in-law, eldest niece and first cousin twice removed and first cousin's ward and eventual granddaughter-in-law, second grandson and first cousin twice removed and stepnephew and eventual nephew-in-law, second niece and first cousin twice removed and daughter's ward and eventual granddaughter-in-law, brother and son-in-law and first cousin's once removed a widow and granddaughter's stepfather, and finally his daughter, sister-in-law, first cousin once removed widow. I'm not sure. But she is the mother of his grandchildren and his nephews. That much is beyond, beyond dispute. dispute. Alright, enough of that nonsense. In conclusion, yeah, pretty good I guess. Great acting, great writing, great directing, and a great conclusion to one of the best characters in the whole show. All adapted from just a few pages in a fake history book. I'd give this episode a 9.5, my highest rated episode of the entire season. Big shout out to the showrunners Ryan Condal and Miguel Sapochnik, as well as the director Geeta Patel, and the writer of the episode Eileen Shim. Now there's not a single bad episode of Hot D, but there is one in particular I have some serious issues with. My next video will take a look at the worst episode of Hot D, what I hated, what baffled me, but also the parts I enjoyed. This isn't a negative channel after all. If I'm going to criticise, hey, it's got to be constructive. Fantasy Haven is a pretty new channel, and I can't wait to explore all kinds of fantasy for you. From fun reviews of movies, games, TV shows, books, to animated lore videos, all focused on your favourite fantasy worlds. If you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, check out my Twitter, all of that good stuff. And let me know down below what your favourite episode of Hot D was. And I'll see you next time.